Okay, so first thing would be just to identify the, the terminology of strength, okay? In the subcategories, the obvious one, absolute strength, is the one everybody's familiar with, okay? So absolute strength, obviously, the easiest way to define it is how much load. Now, it's not necessarily just squat, but it's a lot of single leg work and posterior chain work that we're going to be getting into. Then we have the two categories. Now, there's really, really good research coming out of uh, University of Missouri right now. Dr. Brian Mann presents us on this concept a lot. And we've really taken his research and tried to put it into practice. So you have the speed strength concept, which I'm going to be uh, demonstrating on videos a lot, but also the strength speed concept. Most of it is just centered around bar velocity, and we measure everything with a 10 unit. Then you have the next two categories, which kind of combine together with the dynamic eccentric loading and the reversal strength. Then obviously the stabilizing strength is just structural. But focusing in on the dynamic eccentric loading, the reversal strength, our approach has always been you take speed training back to the muscular level, okay? And I get asked this question a lot in terms of speed development and speed development that transfers to a multi-directional sport like football. Our philosophy is very simple. You don't teach form. There is no such thing as form running. There's no such thing as muscle memory. These concepts are just, they're irrelevant. A lot of them aren't even applicable to what we're talking about. You take speed training to the muscular level. It is developed in the weight room, and the, the development of the muscle itself, getting its ability to contract neurologically, then you stress that activation through load, which is lifting. Then you have the different strength concepts that you can enhance. You basically raise the threshold for force application, which is strength, and you raise the threshold for power application, which is speed strength. Then you maximize your threshold for a stretch reflex, which a stretch reflex is the eccentric to the concentric. So as we develop the eccentric strength, we can then maximize and enhance our eccentric strength under load. Then the isometric contraction is the isometric load will be the key to the reflex then obviously it's concentric power. So all those segments can be enhancing and it's a trainable effect. If we just take that to the muscular level and then we transfer that through a micro progression of plyometrics, that in itself is speed, whether it's linear speed or multi-speed, okay? So we never look at a speed training drill as being, this is the motion, I'm gonna teach the motion, you're better at the motion. The speed training drill just does one simple thing. It will stress tissue that crosses a joint. And if you really segment it out and go through it in a progressive manner, you are just going to enhance that reflex, which will transfer to any multidirectional motion. So we're not trying to recreate the motions we see in sport. We are simply taking it to the muscular level, okay? So now we look at the key to transfer, okay? The key to transfer is the timeline of progression. So obviously we have the eccentric to dynamic eccentric. That's going to be the most important thing. In terms of the load, you have your absolute strength days, then you're gonna have your power days, which is gonna be under load, which has to be built up from a slow to a fast eccentric, okay? Then you have the isometric strength, which is where we're getting to start building up into reversal, which is the isometric strength off of an eccentric or off a dynamic eccentric, which is basically like box squatting pause, okay? And then you obviously you have the concentric down, we're talking about the stretch reflex, the preload from the pause, Meaning that if we're doing dive bomb box squats, which we'll demonstrate, the faster you go down, the faster you're going to go up because of that preload, the potentiation concept. Even if we're isometrically pausing, we are still raising the threshold for force off that eccentric, okay? And obviously, variable loading is the key, especially when you go into concentric picture because you can accelerate through the end range of motion and raise that threshold, okay? So for an example, this is a strength speed concept. So if we're looking at this, this is not going to be the true speed strength yet. Simple classification, and Dr. Mann talks about this a lot, is when you look at, let's say we're going to do a box squat, and we're looking at bar velocity, anything about in that 0 0.7, 0 0.75 meters per second range on the concentric can be classified as strength speed. So we do build basic absolute strength in squat. I'm not going to put a squat up. Obviously, we know how to just get strong on all the variable loading of the squat. But if we're going to start to build up on the eccentric, notice here the tempo is about 1-1x. But I have enough variable load at the bottom unloaded 
that when we're coming up, the intention is to move it fast. But really, the bar's not moving that fast because I have, you know, I have four chains per side. So the weight's fairly light. It's only about 50%. But the load, the variable load is excessive, meaning that even though the intention is there, okay, on the concentric, the intention is there, the bar speed's probably only moving about 0.7 meters per second. So when we're going into, let's say, a three-week microcycle of enhancing power, this is where we start the foundation of the lift is to build the strength speed at this level where we start about 50%, have a certain variable load, and our goal as we progress is to maintain that 0.7 meters per second as we add more and more variable load. So the micro progression is not increasing the load, it's increasing the variable load, okay? Then let's say that we wanted to transfer into more dynamic. Now we're looking at like that 0.9 to hopefully over 1.0 meters per second. So now our intention is to move it fast, but because we have basically built that eccentric load, now we can potentiate it, okay? So, and this is just different variations. So obviously we can have our uh, camber bar squat, our different variations of bar squat, like a safety bar or a belt squat. So typically when we get these bigger guys, like the defensive linemen, I like the belt squat more, not just because of injury, because it's just more comfortable. All right, so if I'm really gonna attack the power concept, I wanna make sure that I am just focusing on the hips. So now I can unload it. So I always belt squat with the box because I do want that, that potentiation pause, okay? So I'll use a kettlebell just to keep the trunk upright, and I'm still only going into right now about a 1-1-X, one, one okay? But when I'm measuring this bar speed with the Tendo unit, it's getting up into that 0 0.85, 0 0.9, meters per second, okay? This is a different angle here. So really, again, if you look at the load, the load's fairly light. For alignment, it's only about 50, 60%. But notice the variable load that I put on. I put two bands on and two chains per side. So really, at the top end range of motion, his intention is to jump. So we can accelerate through the end range of motion. However, that band tension plus the chain is so heavy at the top that even though his intention is to jump, he's not necessarily unsafely leaving the ground. Okay, and then we can just start progressing more into a faster eccentric. Okay, so first couple reps is a 2 1 X. And I'm giving him the hit command, so it's two seconds down, isometric pause for one before we get into that high speed concentric. But again, you notice how you can even kind of see his hips pop through and that fast, almost like his heels are coming off the ground. So he's trying to jump. But again, notice the band and the chain variable load from that angle there, okay? So now, if you want to take that concept and move into the fast eccentric, that's going to be demonstrated here. And again, a different bar load, this is the safety bar. So typically, again, like with the running back, all right, they just take a lot of abuse. I'm not doing this because he has shoulder injuries, even though he has wear and tear on his shoulders. It's just when they get hit so much, sometimes they're just not comfortable getting back into that position. Okay, so again, I want the focal point to be on the load of the hips and the trunk. I don't want to focus in, on the too much of where his arms are. So typically, the bigger running backs, you know, the guys that are over 6'2", 230, whatever, just are more comfortable in those camber bars or the safety squat bar. Okay, but now we're going to focus on the fast eccentric. So now we're kind of dive bomb the squat. But notice that when we do the dive bomb, He's not going to crash his hips onto the pad. So it's going to go down as fast as he possibly can, but right about an inch off the pad, he's going to catch it. So really, the band tension is pulling him down. He, his intention is to drop as fast as possible. Obviously, you also have the, the high chain weight at the top. So we're about a, on a double band here with two chains, so it's a lot of variable load at the top. So once he starts to drive down with gravity, that's an excessive amount of eccentric load that he then has to reverse at the bottom. Again, see the link between the dynamic eccentric load and the reversal strength at the bottom, okay? Again, he's not going to crash, but it's going to be a fairly fast eccentric. So now this is more of like an X1X tempo, where it's fast down, isometric pause, and once I know that he did that pause, I'm going to give him the hit command up. This is the same thing just from the front view, okay? Now, one thing, too, is I know that a lot of powerlifters will unload the squat, and I definitely get the concept where they will do the same type of box squat, 
but then kind of almost sit back and unload and then drive out and come up, almost like you're kind of leg curling off the box and come up. And that is a good concept. It's just when you're not, especially you have football players, you have a, a very, very short period of time. That concept itself is very, very difficult to teach. So I'm not saying it's bad. A lot of pilots use that technique to very, very good success. But remember, their sport is squatting. So I'm not saying the unloaded squat is bad, but I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for football players. I'd rather just do a basic loaded box squat, meaning that when they hit the box, the intention of the trunk is, and the hips is almost like the box isn't even there. So I'm still staying tight in the trunk. I'm still staying tight in the hips. I'm not unloading my hip flexors. So all the box squats you see here are going to have that same kind of concept, okay? And now just a review of what we saw. So again, the bar velocity, the, the standard gauge is going to be about 0.75 on that strength speed, which is what we started with. Then that speed strength is going to be over 1.0, which is what we just ended with with the running back, okay? And then we, if you want to think about a standard tempo of progression, Let's say that I wanted to get into a conjugate method, all right, which is usually where I feel that you can enhance the most power, a good three-week microcycle of a conjugate. Before I get to that three-week microcycle, I will do the building phases, the intensification phases where my, my progression might be like a 2 on one to a 2 one to a 3 one one And my temples, by the way, are always eccentric, isometric, concentric. So, for example, a 3 one one would be three seconds down, hold for a one second pause, and then just come up standard, okay? Where once you build up into that slow eccentric, just to gain the contraction and the force from the absolute speed strength, speed strength point, then when we get to the 2 one x the 1-1-X, one, one and especially the X-1-X, it's a lot more effective, okay? So again, if you notice there, then we might get to a 4 x down to the 1-1-X, one, one down to the X-1-X. Okay, and typically if we're going to do double leg motions, I will have that isometric pause on the box. I like to do the dynamic work on the box for a couple of reasons. Number one is it will enhance pure concentric power. Even though you're going to enhance your concentric power on the X1X tempo because of the potentiation concept of that dynamic eccentric load, you are still working on pure concentric power because you're coming from an isometric position. Okay, and the second thing is just the tracking of the knee. All right, so it's not like I don't believe in front squat, back squat, I'll do it, but I'm working on dynamic. I want to make sure that my intention on the box is set. So that leads into my concentric, meaning that if I'm pushing isometrically into abduction, as I'm going down, especially as I'm on my box, I'm initiating my concentric a lot more effectively. Because if I continue that isometric push into ad abduction, at the hip, obviously my feet won't move because of the frictional force, but the femur in line with the tibia just works well. So it takes a lot of pressure off the knee. And again, especially when we're looking at like the elite level athletes, I think it's just a lot more effective. So if I'm gonna get into those conjugate cycles, I almost always will box squat if I'm gonna do a double leg motion, okay? Now, transferring over into single leg work. So now, we could give dozens and dozens of examples, but I wanna get to the field stuff. So I'm only gonna use one example of a single leg one, which is our Bulgarian squat. So this is just a version of the max effort style of Bulgarian squat. We either do it the barbell under the hamstring, which is a partial, or we'll go the dumbbell wheelbarrow uh, position with, uh, with, with the Bulgarian squat with a full range of motion. So you can load this a lot more and you can variable load this. I know that's not a full range of motion, but still, you're going to get a lot of development just by this position alone, okay? Because of the fact that you can grab a bar and just load it, and you can band it. So if you notice the, the um, wraparound band technique that we use at the bottom of the rack there, okay? Even though we're still absolute strength, I still do like the variable below the absolute strength method. So notice the position of the pad kind of coming across the back of the rack. That sets my foot to keep my balance. Then you just grab the bar and you're still pulling up to the hamstring, but notice that we wrap the band in a double band position. So even though it's a partial motion, that is a ton of variable loading. Okay, so the accommodating resistance factor you're going to get here is excessive even on a partial. So when we're doing our intensification phases and our GPP phases, we are really building a, an excessive amount of absolute strength from this, which is going to lead us into single leg jumps. Okay. So going into the next slide here, the first one's going to be basic, okay?
just a standard Bulgarian squat jump, body weight, on an X1X tempo. So I'm getting the high speed eccentric load. I'm getting the reversal strength. I'm getting the isometric pause off the reversal strength. And then you can progress into an X1X, okay? Or do the same thing with the standard light load. Again, these are the building phases to get to the ultimate variable loading sets. So you could either go body weight, you could go dumbbell, or in the last progression here, you're going to see that we're going to load it with chains. Now, when you go chains, obviously, the range of motion is light. So we have about five, six chains per side. And this is actually easier to set up than people think. You just slide the six chains in the small chain, put the handles there, and now, again, notice at the bottom of the squat, he is completely unloaded. So the only load he's got at the bottom of the Bulgarian was his body weight because all the chain links were on the ground. But at the top, only one-third of the chain links came off the ground, but he had six chains. So the excessive load, I mean, that's about 130 pounds of increased load at the top range of motion. So again, you notice that the intention in that last video was to jump. And his foot may have left the ground a half inch, which is safe, okay? But the variable load prevents him from just excessively coming off the ground. So that's a way to build and enhance, you know, single leg power or single leg speed strength, okay? Then you can just get into the actual jumping factor itself. So if we look at the vertical versus the horizontal, okay? So everything we've built up so far is technically working on vertical power, okay? And I get asked this question a lot in terms of speed and multidirectional speed because speed and multidirectional speed is in a horizontal and a lateral position. So people ask me a lot, why do you have such a foundation of vertical strength, vertical strength speed, vertical speed strength, and vertical power? Because it sets the base. Remember, we're not trying to simulate things. You can't really teach emotion. We are strength coaches. We take it to the muscular level. So the best way to enhance horizontal power is to build a foundation of vertical power, okay? So we built the foundation at the absolute strength level when we squat, when we deadlift, hinge, whatever exercise is your choice, and when we si do single leg work. So whether your approach is double leg squat, single leg squat, you can build a foundation of absolute, you can move into the progression of strength, speed, speed, strength, and enhance power, okay? And by the way, the whole argument back and forth of double leg versus single leg, it's, it's becoming a tired thing, okay? I would say this much. Everything applies, everything works. It just, the key question is not what is better and what is bad, it's when is it appropriate, okay? If you really want to enhance dynamic eccentric loading, okay? Even though all the Bulgarian stuff that we showed is great, you're still having to put so much stabilizing work there that you're not going to be able to get true eccentric motion. I'm sorry, I'm actually breaking the own rules myself. True eccentric motion, okay? So no matter how much you dive bomb those eccentrics, for sure, because of the stabilizing effect, you're never going to be able to overload it. If you're standing on two feet, it's just easier. So all those dive bomb squats and stuff that we saw is very, very effective. So I don't look at it like, single leg bad, single leg good, what's better, what's worse. I just look at it like if I want to enhance dynamic eccentric loading, that's going to raise a threshold for all the concepts of power and reflexive power I'm talking about, you can enhance it quicker on two legs. Now again, yes, you're right that people have different levers and different squat heights, but all that can be evaluated. So we could set the box wherever we want, we could put people in a belt, we could put people in a safety bar, like all the modes that I thought. So I think that it's a little inappropriate to keep going back and forth is, is double leg bad? It's just modify the double leg based off of your athlete. If they can't axle load, do a belt, okay? If it's not comfortable, they're not built to do this, just put them in a safety bar. There's so many different variations and options. If they don't have the range of motion, gain the range of motion through neuromuscular therapy or just cut the range of motion off. But for sure, if you want to enhance reflexive power, you have to build a foundation in the weight room. And some of the easiest way to do it is to go along that eccentric progression. And if you're doing double leg work, you can just get there a lot faster. Okay, even though I understand completely the whole alignment concept and all that, but that's what we have a general preparatory phase for. It's not like we're gonna start doing dynamic eccentric loading with variable load on day one. 
that's a building block to get into those conjugate phases, okay? So now, taking it a step further, now we're going to get into a little bit more of the specificity. So we are building vertical power, and you can also start to get into some of the horizontal work. So the obvious one is just going to be the box jump, which I'm not going to show. I mean, I think we all know how to jump on a box, okay? But if you want to start getting into deep bending positions and you want to start to build pure concentric power, it can be effective. So a box jump is just the eccentric with the reflex into the concentric. A seated box jump is either a modified eccentric or it's purely concentric. So you could do it in this faction here where you saw the feet come off the ground, there was a little bit of a preload. Or this one where the feet are on the ground, there's still a preload with an external variable load, okay? So you could do box jumps or versions of seated box jump or loaded box jump, okay? And then again, this is just a good summary of what we just talked about with the box squat, the back squat, the belt squat, all my Bulgarian squat methods and all my hinge exercises, okay? Then obviously the accommodating resistance it's either bands, chains, or both, where everything I demonstrated up to the point has been both, okay? Then you can, it just depends on the equipment you have. So if you have things like the Kaiser unit, or you have the Vertimax, or you just have some of these, you know, like we have these Sornex racks where you can just put the band attachments right on your body from the rack itself, you can do loaded jumps. Now this is obviously a very, very basic one. The one thing I do like about the Kaiser is once you, as you're building the foundation of vertical, it's easy for you to load a horizontal. And again, I'm not teaching a broad jump, even though when you do these exercises, it will enhance the broad jump. I'm mainly looking at the shin angle. So my force is coming off the belt, and if you look at the direction of where the belt is down to that Kaiser arm, I'm actually jumping in the exact same plane. So my resistance is matching the angle of my body and the angle of the shin, okay? So if you watch when he dropped down, that's what I'm talking about. So you see how the chest comes forward here, and the shin angle starts to come forward. Now when I play it again, he's going to almost fall into almost a 45 degree shin angle. So I'm going to start to get the speed strength concepts in a more specific motion of that shin angle. Okay? So if we're going to resist horizontal power, the Kaiser's actually the most fluid way that I've seen to do it. You know, and again, if we don't have a Kaiser, you can just take a real, real light band and do the exact same concept with some of those light orange and, and red bands, okay? Or just use a landmine. Now, the landmine is punching up, but the hips are still going forward. Again, notice the shin angle's coming down. I'm driving forward. It's just the hands are going up to get the bar out of your face, you know? And then if you want to just get into a deeper one, you look at the one on the left, we're just going to take the exact same concept, but just drive down to here. So once the bar actually comes in the middle, you're doing, it, it's going to be a wide stance. It's just a different variation. But again, notice the shin angle. The shin angle is going to be the key. So you're still enhancing horizontal power if you just have those combat handles there. Okay? So you could do them individual, or you could do them continuous or whatever. Okay? Then you could even go into band jammer. Now, we had these made just because I wanted to be able to do my, obviously, upper body power, but as well as my lower body power. But again, I'm mainly looking at shin angles. So I am just driving my body to my hands. When my chest hits my hands and my shin angle is down and it's matching the angle of my trunk, my intention is to jump forward. Now, obviously, I'm not going to jump because I'm behind the band uh, handles. So my hips are just going to snap forward, okay? So you could do this, sometimes you do this with slow eccentrics, fast eccentrics, but the main thing is just enhancing the horizontal power. So my resistance, again, is it's a variable load. If you look at the band attachment on the peg up into the arm, I'm coming out of the rack, okay? So they make really, really good band attachments on the rack. Now this is, again, just a landmine with just a, much, a little bit of a different handle. This is a lot more challenging for the hips because it's so difficult to initiate the punch with the upper body, okay? So landmine work does, does work well, okay? So that was really overall building the foundation in the weight room, okay? Now, I didn't put a lot of the posterior chain work up there, but same thing. Yes, I mean, we're going to do a ton of isometric reverse hyper work, some concentric reverse hyper work, 
a lot of pull throughs, anything that's going to hinge, okay? Romanian deadlifts, single leg Romanian deadlifts, anything we're going to hinge or anything we're going to hinge back. So whether the load's at the top, the load's at the bottom, we do a ton of posterior chain work to supplement all of our single leg squat motion, double leg squat motion, vertical power, horizontal power, okay? So I do believe a lot in the entire posterior chain. So again, the hyper is going to fix the top and load the bottom. The pull-throughs, the RDLs, are going to fix the bottom and load the top. But you definitely have to do segmental work as well. And again, don't think about trying to recreate a motion in the weight room. You know, I talk to a lot of people that talk about how a leg curl should be obsolete. You know, it doesn't transfer. You never do that. You never execute that motion in sport. In the sport of football, you're not going to do stuff like this, so why do it in the weight room? Again, we're not trying to recreate motion in the weight room, okay? A lot of the reflexes we're going to talk about when we get to the field plow metrics are essential to get that reflex. And it's not just absolute speed sprinting. It is reflexive training. Remember, we're not trying to recreate motions. We are just looking at each joint, the muscles that cross it, what is the action. We're getting it stronger, and we're getting it more powerful, and we're getting it reflexive. Take the training and the speed training back to the muscular level. So we do do a ton of knee flexion exercises under load just to build the posterior chain, okay? Not trying to simulate something you're going to see. So overall, I demonstrated video-wise all of the variations of the squats, but yes, the supplementation of the posterior chain is going to be excessive, okay? So now, the continuum is the key to the plyometric transfer. So really, the foundation we've built is going to be the key to get along the specificity timeline of plyometrics. Again, we're not really going to recreate anything. We are taking it to the muscular level. So you have your vertical plyometrics, which is long response. You have your horizontal plyometrics, which is short response. Now, obviously, the horizontal plyometrics is going to transfer better. But just like anything else, if you don't have the foundation, you're never going to be able to maximize the threshold. So the foundation is vertical reflexive power, which is vertical plyometrics, which is long response plyometrics. I get the fact that the foot's going to be on the ground long, okay, but because in the vertical sense it has to be. But again, we're not necessarily looking at reflexive action of the foot just yet. We are building the foundation of reflexive power, very basic at the foot, which is support system, and a lot more emphasis on the hips which is the, suspe the uh, suspension system. Once we lay that foundation, in addition to getting our foot mechanics better through all our corrective work, the transfer over into the specificity of horizontal plyometrics will be that much more enhanced, okay? So again, when I say the continuum is the key, the vertical leading into the horizontal. Now lateral, all lateral is, lateral looks like the most specific. All it is is reflexive power through the edges. So the entire sport of football is obviously multidirectional. We get that. All right, but think about the foundation at the muscular level, what happens when you change directions. If you change directions anyway, off any motion, that is less than 90 degrees, okay, meaning that I'm running this way, and I got to change directions and come right back out. So really my angle in versus my angle out, let's say 30 degrees you're always going to decelerate off the outside edge of the foot on the inside leg. Then you are going to stop, then you're going to re-accelerate off the outside edge. So really, all the reflexive power on a lateral plyometric is just enhancing outside edge in an everted position or inside edge in an inverted position, one of those two. And there's basic forms of lateral plyometrics, there's advanced forms of plyometrics, but everything's going to go off of how reflexive are you or how strong are you at high speeds in an extreme everted position at the support system or extreme inverted position? One of those two. And you build up slow and then over time you get more and more excessive. So we have a, a, a lateral plyometric version. But again, the foundation still has to be laid. So early in the off season, even at the basic level up to the elite level, we don't do a lot of multi-directional motions. We don't do a lot of multi-directional plyometrics. We have to build the foundation of power and get all of the joints aligned throughout the support system before we get into the edge work. So if I want my change of direction to be effective, 
I need to gain the range, stabilize the range, get strong in the range, get reflexive in the range, and then start to progress up, which is lateral plyometrics. But as I'm doing that, which takes weeks, especially for football players, I still want to build the foundations of power, hence vertical plyometrics, okay? So really, we think of a vertical plyometric setting the base. Everything is going to be the rate limiting factor of the depth jump, okay? If you want the transfer from vertical to enhance your horizontal, the depth jump is the exercise that's the key. But we have to progress into that. So, if we just started the basic stuff, and even at the advanced level, this isn't teaching a jump and teaching a land, this is high speed eccentric load. I'm just happen to high speed eccentric load my body weight. So you could go over hurdles or just do it standard, but the main thing is getting completely vertical. So I'm not really jumping high off the ground, because when I clear the hurdle, my whole body is straight. So I'm not really doing that tuck jump land. Okay, so really it's just concentric power then off the land, it's a high speed eccentric load into a hard isometric contraction at the end range. Okay, it's very, very basic. Or we get into the rhythm depth jump, or we call it a skip. So we're just doing an intermediate step into the reflexive jump. Okay, into the reflexive jump. So I start by just getting a rhythm. I'm still doing a depth jump. I'm just doing a depth jump off of about three or four inches. It's setting the foundation. That will lead into the actual depth jump. And again, even on the depth jump, if you watch, my foot's going to be in contact with the ground long. I'm not really getting up high, but I am extending completely vertical in midair. So either off free turf or over a hurdle. And you could do it linear, you could do it lateral, or you could do it multi. But everything is the same. My concept is still limiting ground contact. That is still my concept. But compared to an acceleration bound, of course my foot's going to be on the ground longer. I'm not doing a lot of reflexive power at the ankle or my support system. It's very basic. I'm overloading the threshold at the hips of the suspension level. Okay? That is just a basic vertical plyometric progression. We go from our jumps to our intermediate skips to our depth jumps. And especially if you're a strength coach at the lower levels. Like we do have a grade school program, a high school program, a college program, a pro. When we get into those basic levels when kids are growing, that is some of the best, most effective plyometrics you can do is getting them to land effectively. Can you time the arm up into the hip, build concentric power, but at the same time when you land, you have that high speed eccentric load, the reversal strength, which is the isometric pause off the dynamic eccentric load. And as basic as it seems, that's some of the most fundamental stuff you can teach in terms of execution of power for young kids, okay? As they're growing, you got to limit their load. But if you can do the foundation of the basic jumps, the basic skips, and then start getting a little bit into the depth jumps, that is some of the most effective power you can build. Now, if you're advanced, yeah, you could go to a single leg, okay? So everything we showed, you could either do a jump, or the skip is what I'm demonstrating here, or go to a depth jump. But again, I'm not getting very high, but notice that off that second intermediate hop, when my intention was to extend, my body was vertical over the hurdle, okay? So that's just the basic foundation now of vertical. Now we get into the horizontal. Now we get into the horizontal, okay? So horizontal plow metrics will easily, easily transfer. And again, not just to straight line running, even though we are doing them in a straight line. This is not just linear speed training. It just so happens that if you want to get into advanced horizontal plyometrics, that ultimate transfer, you have to do it in a straight line to be effective. But remember, we are not teaching anything. We're not trying to teach motions yet. We are taking our speed training back to the muscular level. Okay, so I have a saying I say a lot. Developed muscles don't always try to recreate motions, okay? Whether you're working on a piston action style plyometrics or a cycle style plyometrics, we are not doing this motion or this motion to teach a motion you're going to see in football. We are only doing those motions because we are going under load, okay? The ultimate drill of horizontal plyometrics 
with the piston action is an acceleration bound. But there is a foundation that you lay in order to get up effectively into the acceleration bound. It's three main things. Number one is the weight room work, which we just discussed. Number two is getting to that depth jump level with your vertical, which is the focus on the hips. If you can lay the foundation of those two things, then you just have to micro-progress the support system, which is down into the foot. So if we're going to get into acceleration bound, okay, which is this exercise here. That is about as basic of an acceleration bound as it gets. There's different levels of acceleration bounds. That's very low grade, very basic, meaning that our emphasis wasn't on knee pickup. We're only going about halfway. But again, that acceleration bound there works on the support system. So if I'm coming through here, my attack down is going to load this joint. And what joint is it? We're talking about the joints of the toes, the forefoot, the rear foot, the ankle, up into the way the bones of the shin rotate. That entire link system is the support system. So in our GPP phases, we are aligning those joints. We're getting them strong. We're getting them stable. And yes, we do toe exercises and foot exercises, forefoot, rear foot. There's tons and tons of isometrics you can do during your GPP phases in the weight room. By the time you start to progress into a conjugate phase, what mirrors this outside is going to be things like acceleration bound. But how do you lay the foundation of micro progression that that support system is now appropriate for withstanding that force? You just take that acceleration A skip and you break it down into levels. So if you have a track background, you know an acceleration A skip, which is just this exercise here. I'm really just getting that double hop and I'm working on the piston. So it looks just like an acceleration bound. It's just aggressive at the hips, exact same piston action. It's just a lighter load at the support because I'm doing an intermediate hop. Okay, so again, an acceleration A skip, if you notice, I'm gonna hop left, left, right, right. So left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right. That's acceleration A skip versus the bound. But even that, especially with athletes, has to be micro-progressed. Even at the NFL level, when they come off a train wreck of a season, we're doing GPP phases, even that itself, no matter how good of an athlete they are, if they have ace asymmetries and scar tissue and everything else up in the support system, we break that down. So we call it the acceleration A-skip rhythm, where we're just going to be maintaining a rhythm, basic plyometric hop, and then just make them individual. So I'm still getting that piston, I'm still getting that action down, but notice it's almost in a vertical sense because I'm not moving fast forward. And then you could do that same rhythm and then just start going continuous. So I'm going a little bit faster forward, it's progressing a little bit more into a horizontal. Notice my shin angle will change. That could progress up into the acceleration A skip. And then you could take the acceleration A skip and do it resisted assisted. So essentially, in the weight room you're building your GPP phases. On the vertical plyometric days, you're progressing up into depth jumps. On the horizontal plyometric days, you're micro-progressing up the A-skip level to get the acceleration bound. So I have a standard rule on my plyometric timeline that once we get to that acceleration bound series, we look at three things. How much did our weight room work align the joints of the support system? And is my posterior chain work excessive enough? That's number one. Number two, have I progressed vertically enough to get to some solid depth jump days. And number three, looking up, did I do my A skips to get the acceleration bound? If all those three, th three things check, we move into acceleration bounding, okay? And then you have a ton. I mean, we, I could literally do the entire hour um, speaking on the variations of acceleration bounding. This is a single leg acceleration bound, but make them individual. So you notice he actually is getting that plyometric hop. We're just making him individually. Then yeah, then you could just get into, or continuous here. There's all different types of single acceleration bound you're gonna work. The faster you go, the more of you're gonna get, the more it's gonna load the support system. So again, we're not teaching a piston. We're just looking at a reflex off the support up and off the suspension down. 
okay? And then when the foot hits the ground, it's the reflex of that support again, just more in the forefoot, less in the rear foot. So coming out, rear foot. Coming down, forefoot at the top suspension. We just think of the joints, the muscles that cross it, and what it's stressing. When you take it to the muscular level, you have and enhance each segment to overload power consistently, okay? Or this would be an example of resisted. Again, we, even, we do this. Even though this looks like a track drill, notice I'm doing it with the defensive lineman, but also do it with the wide receiver, okay? So obviously the wide receiver is much faster, but this is a continuous single leg acceleration bound under resisted load. So as we start to progress into that acceleration bound level, you can start to overload the concept. All we're really doing is not teaching something. We just took that support system that is starting to raise up the threshold and getting it to its maximum genetic potential of threshold. Okay? So that is the piston. Now, we're going to move into probably the most controversial aspect of all speed development. That is going to be the cycle training. Okay? So if you think about it, some people call it, you have your, let's say we're running a 40-yard dash, which is a pretty standard measure for football. And down the 40, the first half of it, the first 20 yards, your body's in a forward lean and you're moving in a piston action. You are accelerating. People call that the acceleration phase. Then eventually, gravity dictates your body is going to be upright. There's only so long you're going to be able to handle this forward lean here and do a piston action. Gravity is either going to pull you down, you're going to face plant, or you're going to fight gravity and you're going to stand up. It's subconscious. You don't think about it. just what happens of you versus gravity. Now, once you're upright, you obviously can't do a piston anymore. If you continue to piston, you'll go up. So the body naturally responds and starts going into a cycle mechanic. So yes, if you're running full speed in a straight line and you get to that like 20 to 40 zone, your leg is going to move in a cycle. Now, contrary to what a lot of people think, you haven't really reached your absolute speed yet. You're not reaching your maximum velocity. Your body has the physiological capability of continuing to accelerate up to, you know, sometimes 65 meters. And that's been proven scientifically many times for elite sprinters. So people think of that and say, okay, this is absolute speed work. It's maximum velocity work. And you hear the old saying in football, the only time you're ever going to run full speed in a straight line is something good happens or something bad happens. It never happens, so don't train it. Again, we don't look at training the cycle as just enhancing absolute speed. Because if you break it down at the muscular level of what's going on, how many reflexes are you really going to see at that level? Okay, if your foot comes off the ground, what is stressed? In that residual phase from takeoff to recovery, what's under load? Your hip flexor. That is a stretch reflex at your hip flexor level. Then you are coming up into this position here. So that is concentric knee flexion. But at that transitional phase off recovery, what's happening? You are decelerating the lower limb which puts this under load simultaneously as you are extending your hip. So you just had a powerful stretch reflex at your suspension system. So stretch reflex hip, stretch reflex hip. Then you come down, when you attack the ground, that double knee bend happens, so you get the stretch reflex at the forefoot, a powerful stretch reflex at your hip extensor, and another stretch reflex at your rear foot. That is six powerful stretch reflex from your toe to your forefoot, to your rear foot, to your knee, to your hip. So who cares if you ever see the motion in sport? You are just enhancing power at key muscles crossing joints. Every time you change direction, you're coming into this, you are accelerating out. You need power in your hip flexor, power in your hip extensor. So yes, I firmly believe, and we have the approach, that we train and enhance that cycle motion as best as we can. We don't teach it. You can't teach what I'm about ready to show on video. But if you raise the threshold for force production at this joint, 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 it will transfer to any motion. Now, I know that this whole talk is geared towards football, but we use the same approach for all athletes. It just works really, really, really well with football because football players 
come in wrecked, and you got to get them fast quick. you got to get them fast in football motions. So because we go through a very, very strict micro progression, we check all the boxes through our general preparatory phases off the season, we can enhance speed quick. So we're going to go into the moving claw system. So if I'm working on extreme high levels of horizontal plow metrics, I'm looking at the moving claw. That is going to be my key. So vertical, what's my key? Depth jump. Horizontal piston action, what's my key? Acceleration bound. The cycle motion, what's my rate limiting factor? What's my key? It's the moving claw. Only because that same stretch reflex you're going to feel and enhance as you sprint in a straight line 20 plus miles per hour, you can get the exact same effect at all the motions. So this is ankling moving claw. So if you notice that, I'm just kind of doing a high knee ankling drill, but in slow motion here, notice I hit the claw there. There's my left, there's my right, there's my left. So what is loaded? What is ex what, what's loaded at the extreme level? My suspension system. Because I came off the ground, I went one, two, three. And I did it at full speed. So believe it or not, the stretch reflex you're going to get at that action is very similar to what you're going to get if you're sprinting at 20 plus miles per hour. At the level of recovery, transition, ground prep phase. Now, Obviously, the whole concept of the foot hitting the ground, the support system, is going to be significantly less because I'm moving barely fast forward as opposed to 20 miles an hour. So you are unloading this system, but you are extreme loading this system. And that's a basic, basic version of a moving claw, okay? So then we could do all different variations of it. So you start getting into straight leg mini bound moving claw. So notice how my left leg is kind of inactive, my right leg is clawing. Or go into straight leg bounding full height which is just working on the power of my hip extensors. Or you could put them all together. So you go to straight leg bound, moving claw, but my bounding is at a full height. So again, no, look at the hip power right there, right there. If you notice again, so if you watch, if I, let's say I'm going to do a, a mini bound. My mini bound is here, basic plow metric, but that action here is the stretch reflex. I'm not loading this system, I'm loading this system. Okay? So it's got the highest neurological effect and stress of almost any plow metric you can do. We always tell people, if you want to enhance speed, I don't care if it's multi-directional speed or linear speed, if you get to the moving claw level, your threshold will guarantee be raised. But it's just a very, very, very complex, dangerous exercise. This is the whole concept of football players versus track. Track athletes naturally and genetically have that threshold that's so high that most of it, that stuff there is their preparatory work before their sprint phases. For regular athletes, even professional football players, okay, because of just the wear and tear of the injuries they have, it's very, very difficult to raise the threshold to get to that level safely. But if you go along the timeline, it can be extremely, extremely effective. Our entire NFL off-season training is centered around this concept. And I firmly believe that when I start to get into very, very sports-specific sprint, running back jump cuts, DB uh, backpedal breaks, everything you're going to see in football is significantly enhanced if we get to this level. So some days, yes, we work on sport motions. And some days we just work on taking it all to the muscular level, not recreating a single motion you're going to see in football, but just producing stretch reflexes on a progression timeline that's going to enhance that threshold, okay? So this would be it into play with somebody that actually does play in the NFL, okay? So if you look at Le'Veon when he's going through this, it's about a straight leg bound, moving claw at about the mid-level, okay? Yeah, the whole foundation of what we do is going to be centered around this level. Now, obviously... It was excessively long before we got the threshold raised enough to get safely into this motion. Okay, and a lot of people surprised that, yeah, this is the, the past off season. 
I get asked this question a lot with a lot of the NFL players that I train, especially ones coming off significant injuries, is what is our belief in how to rehab them back quick? This is exactly what we did. So yeah, I think it's well known that he had the PCL tear and a lot of meniscus damage. He did the surgery, did the post-op rehab, and then he was cleared to us in, let's say, February. So we had him from February all the way until the season started. And we heard the same things you heard in the media, that when you're coming off a PCL tear that is that excessive, it's usually 12 months and 18 months before he gets back to full speed. But no, it, it doesn't really take that long. If you really go at the muscular level of what's crossing the joints. So let's look, look at this motion again. This motion is not anything you're ever going to see a Le'Veon Bell do when he plays football. But we did it over and over and over again, not because I'm trying to run a track practice and not because I care about a straight line speed, but again, look at the reflexes. When he's doing the straight leg bound, where's the reflex? It's at the basic level of the support system, and it is powerful at the hip system. When you put the claw into it, it just takes that entire concept and it magnifies it up. So yes, of course we had to modify his posterior chain work because we had to make sure that we didn't interrupt the actual ligaments that was repaired. So yeah, as opposed to doing anything with knee flexion, we did a ton of RDLs and pull throughs. We just wrecked his posterior chain in the weight room. And then we went along the plyometric timeline. Now, most of the stuff vertically and acceleration wise we did in the pool. I wanted the hip motion, but I wanted everything to be unloaded just to be safe. But yeah, eventually we just kept that whole plyometric timeline and we kept working into that moving claw level and we did it excessively almost every week, okay? And he even said, yeah, when he goes like, you know, the interesting thing is I come back and I feel faster now than I've ever felt. And we're not talking about just fast and straight line speed. Nobody's ever gonna uh, confuse Le'Veon Bell for a breakaway running back guy, but he does change directions better and all that stuff. Every, everything that people said that he was gonna struggle with in terms of his ability to change directions, we didn't go back and try to reteach changing directions. We didn't do barely any simulation of running back motions. All I did was I took it back to the muscular level. Every single muscle crossing every single joint, before the session, we looked at its ability to contract. If it wasn't contracting neurologically, we activated it through neuromuscular therapy. Then we stressed the tissue over and over and over again. Then I micro-progressed up from eccentric strength to dynamic eccentric strength, eccentric strength into an isometric, building off concentric power, put it all together with reflexes, and took those reflexes and just went along the, prob the, the progression timeline. So hence, I firmly believe that with pro athletes, coming off an injury is analogous to a young kid developing. I'm not going to reteach a pattern to a pro athlete. I'm not going to teach a pattern to youth athlete. I'm just going to have my progression timeline and follow it. Take it to the muscular level. The body's going to respond to what the body's ability is. So if your muscles have the ability to get into a deep bend and change directions, it will. Are you really going to enhance the motion by, by trying to teach the deep bend? Probably not. This is not something you can teach. People always say that fast guys are fast, and if you're fast, you're going to run fast. You can't teach speed. You either have it or you don't. That's only half true. Of course you can't teach speed. That statement is true. But everybody has a genetic ceiling for power, reflexive power, and rate of force development. Everybody's got it. I don't think I've ever met anybody under any circumstance that came through my facility that had that genetic ceiling already realized. They're usually down here. We just help them reach their genetic potential quick by going along an intelligent progression timeline. Okay? So I do believe a lot in that moving claw series, even though when you look at the drill, it looks like a linear speed, absolute speed track and field drill. It just so happens that track and field athletes will obviously use that because that reflex will help them run faster. But it does transfer easily to multi-directional sports, okay? Now we go into the ultimate of what I believe where it should go, and that is overspeed training. Probably the most controversial topic in strength conditioning today is overspeed. And should it, should, should it not be done? So if you look at, and I'm gonna put up my progression timeline here in a minute. If you look at that vertical we talked about, to the piston that we talked about, to the cycle that we talked about, the ultimate goal is to get to overspeed. There is different overspeed levels. But the key question is not, is overspeed appropriate? It's when it's appropriate. Overspeed will help everybody. But why do people not do it? Because it's dangerous. 
People talk about, well, it, it could get you in an overstride. That overstride will put tension on your hamstring. You could, you could uh, have tissue damage. You could pull a hamstring. Of course, if the threshold isn't there at that transitional phase of running and you cycle down and you're overspeeding somebody, of course they're going to overstride. If you haven't built this threshold enough before you get into that towing phase. So then the question becomes, how do you identify if they're ready or not? We go along that timeline. Same thing we talked about. Vertical depth jump will lead to acceleration bound. Acceleration bound will lead to the moving claw. If you are effective at the moving claw, you didn't enhance the motion, you enhanced the muscle action during the motion. If you have raised the threshold at all those joints during the moving claw phase, usually you are ready for overspeed. The only other thing to think about is trunk, okay? Specifically rotation. So you see about down at the bottom, with all the exclamation points, trunk rotation. So I'm not necessarily talking about just rotating itself. I'm talking about withstanding force. So think about if you're getting assisted into an overspeed run, whether it's a short assistance or a long assistance. Meaning this, let's say that I sprint 20 yards in a straight line. I could get towed the first three steps or I could get towed a full 10 yards before the towing mechanism is released and I continue to sprint. So obviously the longer I'm towed under assistance, the more stretch reflex and power that is. That's the most specific form of a horizontal plow is that assisted overspeed, okay? So if my leg action goes through here and I'm sprinting at 20 miles an hour, however fast I'm going, depending on my distance, think about the torque that creates. So I'm gonna cycle here, that momentum is pulling my pelvis where? It's pulling it forward, meaning that I'm rotating to my right. So if my left side trunk rotators are isometrically strong enough to keep my pelvis set as I'm doing that cycle and withstanding that rotational force, I can be very, very effective. So I've gotta train it at the joint level of the support, the joint level of my suspension, but I gotta be isometrically strong in my trunk. So obviously when you go to like pillars and stuff like that and fan pillars, that'll work on your flexors, extensors, side benders, which is your lateral flexors and your rotators if you're fanning. But you have to also take it to the integrated level. So sometimes the single arm sled march series will be very, very effective. And it seems like a basic exercise, but this is more complex than you think if you really think about the muscle action of what's going on. So you see some from the front view, you see some from the back view there, but look at where the belt is attached to the shoulder. So think about this. If I'm marching forward, with my extensors. I'm concentrically going through hip extension. But every time I take a step, the sled is pulling me this way. So if I don't rotate to my right, what is isometrically contracting to withstand that force? My trunk rotators on the left side, on the front side. So you have rotators on the posterior side, you have rotators on the front side, the anterior side. If I'm marching forward, it's withstanding me backwards, it's my left side trunk rotators that are getting isometrically trained as I'm going through concentric hip extension. So when you sprint, what happens? You go through concentric hip extension, you need to have the isometric force to withstand that force of the torque of what's created through your suspension. So yeah, so if we're ever gonna get into an overspeed phase, we honestly have about good 30 to 45 minutes of prep work with single arm sled marching or some variation of it right before we even get into the prep to lead into the session. In addition to the fact that this will be several weeks of all of the foundations of getting my trunk and spine symmetrical and getting it strong in that symmetrical phase. Okay, or that's just the concentric. So if you watch now, look at the deceleration effect. Okay, it's a very similar thing but we're going backward. This is not teaching a back pedal motion. It's not enhancing a back pedal motion. If you notice that when he's here and he's going backwards from this position here, I am concentrically working on my knee extensors, but if I'm going backwards, the belt's on this arm, where is it pulling me? It's pulling me this way. So it's pulling me into left side trunk rotation. So what is isometrically contracting? My right side trunk rotators on the posterior side. So you could, if we're not really enhancing any motion, all we're doing is just overloading the trunk. The faster you go, the more force it is. But you just have to coach the intention of bracing the trunk 
and not letting it rotate you as you're dragging backward and forward. Because believe me, you're still going to have the ground preparation phase of hip extension, but you still have to have the relaxation appropriately at the knee extensor level to come down. So yes, training those knee extensors are crucial, especially with the trunk rotation portion of it, okay? So what are we building to get into overspeed? What are we building? The vertical leading into the piston, leading into the cycle, leading into our trunk work, which leads into overspeed running. But even at the overspeed level, we take it through progressions. So we have the ankling, ankling buck kick series, which we'll work on excessively. Not because it works on absolute speed. I mean, that's one benefit of it. But we do the ankle, ankle to butt kick because it reduces residual phase. It makes that system more effective at the suspension joint when the foot leaves the ground until you recover. And I don't care if you're springing in a straight line or you're coming out of a change of direction. That residual phase is identical. The only difference is when you came off that break, you're in an everted, inverted position. That's the only difference. But your leg will still come off the ground. You still have residual. You still have that stretch reflex. You still have recovery. You still have transition. You still have ground contact or ground prep and ground contact. The piss and action is identical. There's no difference. That's why straight line sprinting and all the progressions up will enhance multi-directional motions because you're doing a linear piston out of every single change of direction. That is really the key. The key isn't just the braking system. The braking system is high-speed eccentric load. That can be developed in the weight room. How do you actually get the reflex out? You got to train the reflex out. That is a transfer to the field. Okay, so this would be a basic level. Notice that I've got the assisted cord here. Now, if you guys have seen this mechanism, the good thing about this is it's easy to transport, and they're very, very, very inexpensive. Okay, so I think, I bought, I think the website's called everythingtrackandfield.com. If you go to that website, it's just called Overspeed Trainer. They'll have like a picture of a guy towing a guy. We don't have the, the people towing each other. What we have is we got the mechanism where one coach is holding it, okay? It's coming around this spin action and onto the athlete. So if you look at I've got a belt on and the clip is facing down. And then it's towed behind me. So let's say it's anchored here. It comes around the pulley system and comes back and is fixated onto my belt. So if somebody's keeping tension on this cord and keeping tension on this cord by running as I'm running, then obviously what's going to assist me? The spin mechanism of the pulley. So really, and this has been measured, with that mechanism, it's only 5% faster and it's at a constant overload. So if it's consistently only 5%, that is not going to put me into an excessive overstride, number one. Plus, it's going to enhance what? Obviously, I'm going to move my piston action faster, so it's overloading this. My foot's going to come off the ground quicker. It's going to enhance that. The only thing that could happen is if you overstride because you effectively did not raise the threshold of the stretch reflex from here to here, from transition to ground prep. But again, how do you enhance that? Weight room. Acceleration bound, progression up into the moving claw. That is a trainable effect that can be enhanced, okay? So again, this looks very, very basic, but this is going to be like we call level one of overspeed training. I'm just doing ankling the butt kick, but I'm being towed 5% faster than I'm normally doing it. And there's the towing mechanism there, okay? Then we kind of progress up. We'll do long ankling, long ankling the butt kick. We'll do our build-up A runs. We'll do all of our mechanism drill under assistance to get to an acceleration, okay? So acceleration is here. So now you can really see the towing mechanism well. So notice that the coach is standing here and just holding on to the toe, which is coming around the pulley. So if you imagine, I've got it in my hand, the pulley's about, you know, what, a foot off my hand. One side, put that back up, please, sorry. One side is attached to Jarvis, it's coming around the pulley, then the other side is anchored on the fence. So when the coach pulls Jarvis out, he is going to be under load for about the first 10 yards. Then watch the coach stop running. Obviously, as soon as you stop running, the tension comes off, it'll fall right off the belt. So we are doing a 20-yard sprint, but only the first 10 yards is under 
an overspeed mechanism, okay? And we are not doing this to get faster. We are doing it to overload the systems. So load right there, and then it's unloaded. You see how the belt just kind of fell right off because, it, because it, it's, it's got the belt clip facing down, okay? So we will start to progress and record. This just like in the weight room. We record everything. We have that whole plumb line kind of put in the training manual, and we just go step by step from vertical to piston to, to, to the overspeed phase one, overspeed phase two, overspeed phase three. And when you get to these high-level overspeeds, how long are they sprinting and how much load are you under? All you have to think about is what excessive load are you putting across the suspension system and what excessive load are you putting across the support system and where's the link? Knee joint, trunk. Isometric, reflex. So you have the two systems, you have the link, okay? So really then we get into the overspeed max threshold. So the only thing I'm concerned about, and I think we should concern ourselves with as performance specialists or strength and conditioning coaches or speed coaches or whatever, we're all everything pretty much, is threshold. That's it. Because people ask me a lot in terms of why do you do so much form running with football players that you can't teach them how to run? Because we're not doing form running. I'm selecting a speed drill because I am just trying to raise the threshold of force. And certain drills will attack certain joints more. We just talked about all the joints of support, all the joints of suspension. Certain drills will stress those appropriately. So in my approach, I don't necessarily think there's such things as muscle memory. You don't like teach emotion and hope that their, their brains rem or their muscles remember it. It's a made up concept. Muscles know three things. Contract, relax, and they have a threshold that you can raise a force. They have a threshold you can relate of dynamic force. Okay, so get it to contract well from a neurological level. Then enhance that contraction by loading that tissue. Absolute strength, speed, speed, strength, power. Make it reflexive. Make it reflexive. Okay, get it to relax appropriately. And each system can raise the threshold. Can raise the threshold, okay? So again, we put the levels there, ankling, butt kick, first step acceleration, all that stuff. And then again, the multi-directional. Yeah, we even do towing into multi-directional motion. So we will have them do a 10-yard sprint into a cut-up pattern. Okay, well, we'll do that. But we'll only assist maybe the first five yards of the 10-yard sprint zone before they get into a cut. So now we are overloading the threshold of that awful multi-directional motion. Okay, so when we put it all together, Obviously, as we're enhancing muscle action, we want to enhance the specificity. And we could go drill after drill after drill. What's well, in an agility ladder, a double agility ladder, you're going over hurdles, you're going over lines. All the stuff's the same. When you get to lateral plow metrics, you are just looking at one specific factor. The redirection of force off that support system, which has now changed. That's it. So if I'm doing acceleration bound, I am excessively overloading my support system. If I'm doing a line bound here, I'm doing the same thing. What is this? It's a high speed eccentric load, but upon my absorption of force until I accept body weights, that initial absorption of my foot hits in an inverted state. So can I absorb force off the inside edge of my foot in an inverted position? Or if I'm doing a line bound, but now I'm going here. It's the exact same thing, same concept, but upon ground contact, when I'm absorbing that force, and what force am I absorbing? I'm absorbing my body weight plus gravity. I'm absorbing it in an everted state off the outside edge of the foot. So you can load it. You can do dynamic eccentric loading. You can do isometric pausing off dynamic eccentric loading. And then you can get into continuous bounding, which is that redirection of force. So how do you redirect force? You build the foundation. How do you build the foundation? You build eccentric loading. So you have different patterns where you could go over hurdles to do a combination of vertical and lateral. You go in and out of agility ladders to do a combination of more lateral. Because if you're not going up, you're going out, it's going to enhance the angle more. If you come up, you're just adding gravity to it. So pretty much every line bound off the inside edge, outside edge for lateral plyometrics can be there. 
So again, as the, we go through a GPP phase, what are we doing? In the weight room, we're building the foundation. On the field, we're doing vertical. On lateral, we're doing jump and hold. Then we start to slowly progress through our intensification phases into, let's say, a conjugate phase. Where are we at on the field? We should be at that transfer between acceleration bounding and moving claw. Where are we at lateral? We're on hardcore bounding over micro hurdles. Where do we progress into as we get through our power phases? Advanced moving claw and overspeed. So everything kind of links up from the weight room to the field, to the field basic vertical, field specific horizontal, to field specific to motion, which is lateral, which is lateral, okay? So that's the kind of the, 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 the progression timeline. So what does it look like? This would be a sample of a vertical. So we have our linear lateral multi, which I showed in the video. That's not really progressing. It's not like linear progresses the lateral, progresses the multi. Everything is up. It's just different variations. But you could start with the simplicity of a double leg jump, which we showed on video, to a double leg skip, to the key aspect, which is double leg depth jump. Then you could get into single leg work. You could progress up into a higher hurdle. You could progress up into a track hurdle. So the only difference between going over the hurdle I showed in the video, going over a track hurdle, is when you go over the track hurdle, you have to tuck. It's not like one's better than the other one. It's just the tuck is a little bit more excessive. So if you want to overload your vertical, you do tuck jump over a track hurdle. It just means when you come down to the ground, that plus gravity plus the fact that your leg is attacking the ground is going to be excessive. So we definitely just start progressing from double leg to single leg, from low hurdle to high hurdle, from standard depth jumps you saw on video to advanced depth jumps you're going to see with that tuck jump over a, of a high track hurdle. Okay? That is the foundation. I and mean, everybody's got this in their training manual. I don't care if they're eight years old or they play in the NFL. We have everything progressed from our weight room work to our basic transfer work to our advanced transfer work. Okay? So it's not like we're only going to do vertical first and then horizontal second. We're going to build. So let's say that we're looking at a two month macro cycle with two three week micro cycles within it and maybe a download phase in between. So as we go through that two month macro cycle, we are not just working on the foundation of vertical. Some days will be vertical, some days will be horizontal, some days will be lateral. But if we're at the beginning phase, working on jumps and depth jumps, working on the basic A skip with that rhythm concept I showed, and we're working on jumping and landing lateral. So we're really raising the threshold of basic up, specificity out, and motion specificity of lateral. But how do we raise the threshold? High speed eccentric loading with isometric pausing. And you can do it on every single system we just showed. Okay? So that's what the vertical page looks like. Then this is the horizontal. So we have three main concepts. The acceleration on the left is the piston. And again, how do we enhance the piston? We talked about that acceleration A skip, rhythm, individual, rhythm continuous, or the basic acceleration A skip, which looks like a version of a track and field plow metric. What are we doing? We're keeping it basic at the support, overloading suspension. When the threshold is raised suspension and you got the support up to a medium level, where do you go? What's the rate limiting factor? Acceleration bound which is here. Acceleration bound alternating. Then you could continue to progress by the versions I showed on video of the enhanced motions of single leg acceleration bound or single leg resisted acceleration bound. What's the difference? They're both power at suspension. The main difference is as you go up the timeline at the support level with the single leg work, it will raise the threshold of everything that links up the chain, okay? Now, absolute speed, this is probably um, a bad terminology. I should just call it piston and cycle. Because remember, the cycle pattern doesn't mean we're enhancing absolute speed sprinting. It is a benefit, but it's not the intention of what we're doing. The intention of what we're doing is the reflex. So you can do the exact same thing. You know, you have the the piston action we showed, but you could take that cycle concept and go up the progression timeline. So let's say that I'm gonna go rhythm, make them individual. I'm doing that 
enhanced cycle motion, or you could just get into that cycle with acceleration A skip here, or that cycle with ex uh, absolute speed bounding, double leg alternate. We keep going up the progression timeline. Where's our rate limiting factor? Straight leg bound moving claw right there. That's what we're trying to get to. So as we go down that timeline across a macro cycle, we get to that level. The key question is, is it appropriate or not? What do we look at? What do we do down the cycle timeline? Did we get to acceleration bounding yet? Did we get to depth jumps yet? What is our foundation in the weight room? Do we have enough days in the weight room where we're enhancing our posterior chain work, our eccentric loading on our speed squats? Are we symmetrical from a range of motion standpoint in our support and our suspension? Once we check all those boxes, we go. Because what's going to be great about the moving claw and enhances the threshold for assisted overspeed. And you go basic level up to advanced level. So yeah, we just have these in everybody's training manual and just record everything. Now obviously everything's going to be related to neurological fatigue because we might have this day playing on the timeline, but they come in, their nervous system is wrecked, but that's the unplanned method. We could state that for any aspect of strength and conditioning. Just because you check the boxes and you're due for overspeed doesn't mean the athlete's going to be in a neurologically enhanced state for it. But again, that's just unplanned periodization, which everybody does. Okay? But really, that's going to be the key. So if you want to, I always look at it like this. Before I get into the hardcore simulation of motions, like, you know, the assisted cut-ups for a wide receiver or the hardcore double and triple jump cut and, and double sled work for the running backs, or just working at a metabolic phase for my linebackers' DBs, or working on my hardcore change direction chase drills for my defensive line. Before I get into all that stuff, have I raised the threshold across the joints appropriately enough? So yeah, we use this for enhancement of speed. We also use it for, are we now at the threshold where I can do all this football simulation motion and not just wreck my joints because I don't have the eccentric strength built up to be able to come from a change direction in and out. So now we're doing specificity without loading the joints.